O Christ our God, we are all pledged to serve thee with our whole being. Help us to continue to work for thee through our church without seeking praise, without seeking personal gain, without judging others, without a feeling that we have worked hard enough and now can allow ourselves to rest. Give us strength to do what is right and help us to go on striving and to remember that activities are not the main thing in life. The most important thing is to have our hearts directed and attuned to thee. Amen. Thank you, Father Don. And again, welcome all of you. Thank you for joining Antiochian Women of the East Fall Retreat. And we're honored to have Mother Gabriella as a speaker and uh, a guest, His Eminence, Metropolitan Joseph, and His Grace, Bishop Thomas, and all of you. Welcome to joining us. Um, it's honor to have all of you. It's what a beautiful day. Reverend Mother Gabriella, she's the abbess of the Dormition Orthodox Monastery. Born in Romania in 1955. Mother Gabriella entered the monastery of Viretic. How you say it, Mother? Is that correct? Rivetic? Viretic? Yes. Uh, Romania in 1974, under the name of Sister Veronica and became the spiritual daughter of Mother Vendicta Braga. In 1978, she came Mother Benedicta, with Mother Benedicta to the United States to the Monastery of Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Alwood City. I like, I have special love for that monastery. I love Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Pennsylvania. In 1984, at the age of 29, sure of her calling and desire to serve God, she took the monastic vows and became Mother Gabriella. Three years later, in 1987, together with Mother Mandicta, they came to Rives Junction, a small farming community in southern Michigan, to found the Orthodox Monastery of the Dormition of the Mother of God. Years of hard work followed. Upon Mother Mandicta's retirement in 1992, Mother Gabriella became the new abbess. Mother Gabriella is well known in Orthodox community. She travels to Orthodox parishes throughout United States and Canada, conducting a spiritual retreat and lecturing on various subjects. She also conducts a retreat at the monastery together with Father Roman Braga, the spiritual leader of monastic community. What a beautiful, Mother Gabriella, it's honor to have you. Really, we have a spiritual lift this morning. It's honor to have you, and the floor is for you. Please make sure everyone mute mute yourself and enjoy the talk. And mute me and go ahead, Mother Gabriella. Thank you. <clears throat> your blessing, Your Eminence, Sayyidina. God, God bless you. <laughs> You're, um, Bishop Thomas, uh, your prayers. Uh, thank you, Lula, for uh, your invitation. Uh, I'm always honored and very happy to be with Antiochian women. It's not my first time. Um, of course, it would have been much nicer to be in person, but as we'll have to wait. Uh, but nevertheless, we thank God for this possibility also, uh, that we still can come together because the most important thing is that we are united in prayer. We are spiritually united, even though uh, physically we might be separated, but that's not a true separation. That's not a separation because we have this physical body and we live in different places of this earth, this blessed earth that God has uh, created, uh, but our unity is in Christ and we have that. So uh, let's not forget that. So I think the topic is um, very appropriate and the time is very, it's perfect. Um, so tomorrow is the first day of Advent, right? Um, so uh, is everyone able to hear me? Yes, mother. Okay. Yes, mother. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so just to make sure. All right, so... Um, Christ is the midpoint, right? Christ is in the, the midpoint of history. 
right, as the midpoint of our salvation. So um, we really be able to understand who we are, what is our purpose here on, on earth, um, is to really have to focus on the incarnation. That's the most important thing. Uh, that we understand our existence, of our identity, our uh, destiny, all of those things. And those are good questions that we always should have. Uh, our um, former uh, father Roman of blessed memory, we always would say, we as human beings are alive as long as we have a question, that we have a question mark. When we don't have a question, something is wrong. We're spiritually dead. So always have to have that question so we can look for the answer. So man is made, created by God uh, to search. And our search is for our identity in Christ. So in order to understand a little bit of uh, what is uh, 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 Christmas, what we celebrate, it's of course is the coming of Christ on earth. And flying through the microphone, it's on unmute. Excuse me, can you please unmute yourself? So um we need to prepare ourselves and we need to prepare our hearts. And to do that, we find that there is a preparation there and uh start with, with the old testament. And so it is important that at this time, as we start Advent. As we start our journey towards what we many times we say towards Bethlehem, uh, where we find Christ. Actually, it's not, of course, not a spiritual, not in the spiritual sense, in the not in the physical sense, in the spiritual sense. Uh, uh, our journey to Bethlehem is, um, I will say, from the beginning. Uh, make sure that during this time of uh, Advent that we look for and read the prophecies of the Old Testament, prophecies concerning the coming of, uh, of Christ. There is um, a book that's called the Prophetologian. Actually, we, our monastery published it, but it's put together by uh, Bishop Dimitri uh, and has many, many of the Old Testament readings uh, and their selection of the Old Testament readings that are read throughout the year. Um, at uh, different, uh, the celebration of different saints and feast days. And of course, before Christmas, you'll find them there. Uh, it's very helpful, except for us to understand, to have an understanding of the coming of Christ. Now, from um, God's per per perspective, Jesus is man. Jesus has become man. From man's perspective, God, Jesus is God. So that's very important that we know Jesus Christ is God incarnate. He's not just a nice man or a prophet or whatever um, has been called throughout the ages by different people. So in uh, this act of uh, the incarnation, we see that change, that transfiguration from uh, the anger of a just Jehovah, God of the Old Testament, right? Yeah. Uh, then to the Jesus, the Lamb of God, the change from law to grace, uh, from the creation to incarnation, from let there be light, that God said at, at the beginning of the world, to this is the man that was Jesus on the cross. So the nativity of our Lord is both glorious and humble. We see we have the star and the cave, right? Um, we have the philosophers, the magi, the, uh, and then we have the shepherds, the simple men. We have the angels that come, the material beings that come from heaven, and the dumb beasts, the animals in the, in the manger. And the coming of, of our Savior in the world uh, did not happen overnight. So because mankind was not ready 
to after the fall to receive Christ. So the way had to be prepared. Men's heart had to be trained and purified and able to hear the word of God. That's what we always have to do, to be able to hear the word of God, to hear what God has to say to us. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to purify our minds, our hearts, to recognize him and to recognize him in the world. So when did Christ come? At the fullness of time, the scripture says and tells us. Even St. Paul in the Galatians also says that God sent his only begotten son into the world to become man for us. And St. John also, the famous verse from the Gospel of St. John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, so incarnation means that we, man, can become like God. We have that term that we use theosis or deification. Uh, another good book to read during this time is um, St. Athanasius' book on the incarnation, and that's the title. It's a small book. Uh, if anyone will be able to read that, that we have so much uh, in that small book. So he says, God was made man that we might become God. And that's something that's very awesome when you think that we can become like God. Um, so the incarnation of God was in the mind of God from the beginning, from the very beginning. Um, there's the mystery that is hidden from before the ages and unknown even to the angels. So this is how great a mystery this is. The, because we as his creation tend to the prototype and we are created in God's image. So our tendency is to become like our creator. This preparation began with the promise or the covenant that God made to Abraham who became the father of a great nation that is the people of Israel, the spiritual forefather of all those who were to believe in God, of all those who will become Christians. We may want to say that. So God said, blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I'll multiply your descendants as the star of the heaven and as the sand that, uh, which is on the seashore. And your de descendants shall possess the gate uh, of their enemies. And in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And that's Genesis chapter 22. So, and then the, this promise was reinforced with Isaac, the son of Abraham, to whom God said, and in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Then to patriarch Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, God said, and your de descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad in to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And then to the same patriarch, God revealed that from the loins of Judah, which was Jacob's son, a savior will rise. It says, a scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until what was promised shall come, and to him shall be the obedience uh, of the people. So what we see here again and again, that God has promised his salvation, and he keeps his promise. We always have to remember, God will keep his promise. Even if we move away from God, even when we forget God, when we don't keep our promise, he keeps his promise. When we are unfaithful, St. Paul says, he remains faithful. Especially at this time that we are living through now at difficult times, it's very important to remember that God keeps his promise. So when, we, when Israel was being held captive in Egypt, 
which uh, signifies the land of sin. So when we find ourselves entangled into a worldly way of life, we consider it to be in Egypt. So God raised up Moses to deliver them from Egypt. So Moses is a type of Jesus because he was the savior. Um, so his mission was to lead the people out of the land of sin. Moses tells them, the Lord will, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. And from your midst, him you shall hear. So here Moses already prophesies of the coming of Jesus. So having brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, which means baptism, and led them to Mount Sinai, where he received the Ten Commandments, which are the instruction of proper worship. So through the law, Israel came to know the true God and learn the, how men ought to live with one another. In the law of Moses, God made perfectly clear that he alone is God. So the first of uh, the Ten Commandments state, I am the Lord thy God, who have brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So it was God's will that the chosen nation will uh, learn to do his will. Okay, now I put it back on you. And in all things, so that she may bring forth the most perfect fruit. Okay, so all this time of preparation, it was to bring per the perfect fruit, which the one who is perfect love and purity of heart would surrender her whole being to God and become a vessel worthy to bear the Son of God in the flesh. This is the most blessed Virgin Mary. Therefore, the final consummation of God's plan of preparation. So all this time was preparation for the Virgin Mary to come to be born because she was the one to give birth to Christ in the flesh. So God takes a material body. Again, St. Athanasius says that God has created the matter so as to fit to his incarnation. The premises of God's nativity from the Virgin were laid at the creation of the world. But to assume a material body, it was necessary to create that affinity between God and matter. You follow me, I hope, okay? So um, he took the matter of this universe into his body and he lifted it up into heaven as God ascended, as Jesus ascended into heaven and it sits at the right hand of the Father. So all the chemical elements of the earth are in Jesus' body as in our bodies, and through the deification of man, this material universe is transfigured. As the scripture says, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. However, our unity with Christ and deification is sacramental, right? This is how we grow in God through the holy sacraments. And the holy sacraments take place in the church and through our participation. The holy sacraments are the channels of the uncreated energies, gifts of the Holy Spirit that makes us adopted sons of God according to Christ. St. Paul says that in Romans. So now it is the paradox of the incarnation from the Virgin is uh, an incredible drama. The son of God becomes the son of a virgin. The master takes uh, the form of a servant. Heaven is united with earth. 
what is transcendent with the temporal, God is united with man. So the universal stage of, uh, of uh, uh, this is uh, Jesus as the drama. It is an existential drama in which eternity enters into history. So the nativity of our Lord is both glorious and humble. St. John Chrysostom explains this mystery more deeply. So he says it was necessary that the Son of God entered this world by a pure and holy birth. For as Adam was formed from the virgin earth and from Adam without the help of woman, the woman was formed. Now a daughter of Eve, that is the Holy Virgin, on behalf of Eve, we paid the debt to Adam by giving birth to Jesus, which is new Adam, without the help of men. So we refer to the Virgin Mary as the new Eve, and we refer to Jesus as a new Adam. When you hear those expressions in the readings of the scripture and in the services and the hymns of the church, we'll know what we're talking about. With regards to the implication of uh, man's return to the original state, which is why we have the incarnation, the Holy Fathers speak much about virginity, purity, chastity as being superior um, spiritual state. For it, uh, it uh, presupposes a struggle, an opposition to what is corrupt, what is fleshly, what is temporal. So we all should struggle for virginity, for the purity, for chastity of mind and soul and heart and body. Um, it is the way of, um, of how we um, rise above what is base, what is earthly, what is material, what it pulls us down to this earth. So the great promise was that God would become man. There's no other religion in the world that believes in a God that became man. Christianity is the only religion. God is the Father, no one can ever see. We know that. Jesus said that also. But then, of course, he told Philip, right? That he celebrates in Philip today, that if you see me, you see God, you see the Father. So, by taking flesh, Christ, which is the Word of God, the expression of the Father, we can see and we can touch. He was hungry. He was thirsty, he spoke, he walked without losing his divinity, being God at the same time. This is the example of how we are to be saved. He gave us that example. So the infinite takes on a human nature and the human nature is united to the infinite. This is the great mystery of our faith. So um, let's see what, so why did God choose one nation? Because Christ was, uh, came out of one nation, that was the nation of, you know, the chosen nation, the people of Israel, the Hebrew nation we call. So here's the notion of nation and the church. By being born on earth, so Jesus enters into history. Thus, he has to be part of a nation, nation, of a culture, of a physical geographical place, and a family. Other Roman used to call this the research team. So, you know, when you do some research, some work, you choose a group of people to work together. So this is what God has done. So the mission of the Hebrew nation was to bring was the Virgin Mary. 
who is to give birth to Christ in the flesh. So uh, in the prophecy of Isaiah, it's very clear. He says, a virgin will give birth to a child and his name shall be Emmanuel, which means God with us. So with this nation, this mission, the Hebrew nation has fulfilled its plan. And now all those who accept Christ as the Messiah become the chosen people of God. So we all who believe that Christ is Messiah, the anointed one, God incarnate, we are the new Israel, the chosen people, the new Israel. Here, um, I may want to say, uh, uh, add one more thought about nation and mission. Uh, every nation has its own characteristic, its own guardian angel, we read in the prophecy of Daniel, has its own mission and plan and in the plan of salvation. So each one of us from wherever we come, whatever our background is, we have an identity in God and we have a mission in this world. So uh, given the unique situation we find ourselves here in this country, we as Orthodox Christian have a task uh, to have to take it seriously our role in this country and to understand why are we here? What is God's plan with us? I would say that now is the time to look into this a little bit more deeply. Have some more discussions, do a little bit more um, research, um, pray, uh, read more to help our, um, maybe our young adults and our children who understand what is their role in the society as citizens, as members of this particular nation. Is the mandate of the, of the United States as a nation, is it over? We all look back and say, this is, was. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can refer in the past time that it's a great nation, uh, a haven for so many people the land of opportunity and the freedom to worship um, that we have had until now, are we now forgotten by God and left to our own selfish desires? These are some rhetorical questions for us to contemplate. Many of the parishes of the Orthodox parishes have been uh, maybe founded by what we referred to as immigrants. Many of our parents or ancestors have come to this country, perhaps for a better life or for a better education. But the true and eternal reason God has brought the Orthodox people to this country is um, to bring Christ, to bring the church into the new world. bring this true faith in this country. We who are alive now, as much as uh, the generation before us, have the same mission, to be the apostles of Christ. So let us now return back to, to our subject of nativity. So by Christ's incarnation, communion with God was possible, is possible. So the incarnation is a proof of God's love for men. For God so loved the world, let's not forget that. By his birth, he gives us the sign of his limitless love. Nothing and no one could have bridged that gap between God and men, between heaven and earth, except God himself. By his divine emptying, by his kenosis, by his extreme humility, So even after more than 1,000 years of Christian theology, we cannot say that we know the Son of God because uh, the way of the knowledge of God is ascetic and ever. 
united with total experience in God. So it's not only an emotional, intellectual exercise. It is um, our experience in God. It, it, it requires an aesthetic um, effort. Uh, Christ uh, um, uh, uh, came on earth, he suffered, he died, he arose, so we may have life eternal. Because his coming, all the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament, so they were the prophets chosen by God, they're the right, they're righteous, but they laid in darkness, they sat in darkness because paradise was closed. And the St. Paul writes to the, to the Romans that um, God has uh, had them wait. Uh, so, uh, so we all together enter into, into paradise. So more than, more than 2,000 years have passed since the word of truth became incarnate on that cold winter in Bethlehem. In that dark and humid stable, God descended. Really? And well, the she wears red blue, so does Jesus. Oh. Yes. I, so he, said, he laid a new foundation uh, for, uh, for the destination of man. How is the Son of God became the Son of Man is a mystery. Um, the hidden, a mystery hidden from before the ages. And it is possible to understand only through faith. Where God wills, the word of nature is surpassed. We sing in one of the hymns of the church. So through the nativity of Jesus, matter is deified and acquires a new dimension. Matter becomes a condition for the salvation of our souls. Without the matter, without the body, Okay, we cannot be saved. We are baptized with water. We are chrismated with oil. We commune with Christ by means of bread and wine. Because all these elements are part of the body of our Lord, who was born in Bethlehem. So by the transfiguration of Christ's body through, his, through the resurrection, the matter of his universe sits today at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So we need to remember that, that our body is the means of our salvation. So the deep sense of the Feast of the Nativity is the transfiguration of the material universe. God and the world become permanently united in one without confusion, without losing their, their identities. We understand here the goal of mankind and universe as the spiritual coming back to a new heaven and a new earth when the world will end. So we understand salvation as a whole, man and the universe. St. Paul writes to the Romans that creation groans for the return of man to God. By our way of life, every one of us, we transfigure the cosmos, bringing everything closer to God. Or by our own life, way of life, we can destroy God's creation also. So, Salvation is together with the whole universe. And um, uh, we, um, it's the St. Maximus the Confessor, uh, one of the great fathers of the church talks about the cosmic liturgy. Uh, that when we, when man celebrates the holy liturgy, the whole universe joins in. The plants, the trees, the birds, Everything joins in, in the celebration of the liturgy. And that the end of the world, 
is not a destruction of the world. It's very important. It is in the scripture that it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. God did not create the world to destroy it. God did not create man to destroy it. On the contrary, to save it into eternity, to change it, to transfigure it, to become new. So it still remains a mystery. We can understand just a little bit here and there, but I don't think we should really try to understand this with our minds and totally here on earth. Um, in many of the hymns of the church, we say that we understand now is through a mirror, but only when we pass on into eternity that we we'll fully understand God. So when we read the, uh, the gospel passage about nativity, I would dare say that we are inclined to think of how uh, the innkeepers of Bethlehem refused to receive the Holy Virgin, a young pregnant woman. But actually they did not refuse the Virgin Mary, they actually refused Christ who was in her womb. As true Christians, we should expect that we may suffer the same treatment. There is no place in the world for those who bear God in their hearts, in the presence of the world, in, the, in his presence, in Christ's presence, the world feels uncomfortable. But he came to wake us up, to shake us off uh, uh, the indifference, the blindness, the stubbornness of our hearts. He obliges us to examine and critique our lives and our destiny. To pull us up from the many and insignificant occupations of our everyday life. To raise us up to a higher level of dignity. He asks us to leave our uncomfortable way of life and to accept a rough discipline the freedom which is offered to the Israelites in the desert. Perhaps if we had been in Bethlehem, we too would have slammed the door in, in the face of the Virgin. Why? Because whoever receives Christ in his heart receives the whole drama of salvation, including the cross. One cannot separate the Son of God from the purpose for which he became incarnate. As we praise in the nativity, the cross is on the horizon. The hymns of the feast of the nativity uh, are linked to the baptism and to the hymns of Good Friday. We can elaborate, but if we have time, I'll go on. So Christmas is comfortable because it presents Jesus as a baby is a child, unpretentious, not threatening. Christ who does not interfere in our lives, everybody loves children, right? Everybody loves a child, a baby. Um, so, uh, but all kinds of people meet on the way to Bethlehem. They're sinners and righteous, virtuous and malefactors. And, uh, and they feel comfortable. But how many follow him to Nazareth, to Capernaum, to Jericho, or on the mountain of temptations, fasting and confronting the devil? There are few. And on Golgotha, there's no one. So if the nativity of Christ does not mean the incarnation, okay, growth, suffering, death, and resurrection of the Son of God with us, it doesn't mean anything. So we have to be careful. In vain are the good food and the presents and the celebrations and the good time and the singing. Um, we need to remember the words of Isaiah who said, bring no more futile sacrifices, incense and a, is an abomination to me. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your 
appointed feast, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am very uh, weary of uh, bearing them. What he wants to say is that we need to be careful that we don't bribe about, we feel good about us uh, maybe making some effort uh, during the fasting periods that we abstain from this or that and we have done some charity or whatever just for the sake that we look good in the eyes of the others or whatever. It has to be a change of heart. God accepts a humble and contrite heart. So in the joy of Christmas gushes forth from the fact that we are the sons of God. So you have to be careful not to transform this feast, this mystery, into uh, uh, just a uh, carnival, um, a celebration that is only of for the moment. One point I make to, want to make clear is our life in Christ is to live his life on earth, not just to remember or commemorate. It's not just an anniversary. It's not just a commemoration. It is that we need to identify with him in order to be able to receive him. And for that, we need to, to prepare. This is why we have this preparation, this time of preparation, which is called Advent. Uh, it means that we anticipate something. And this is why we have actually the other uh, Lenten uh, fasting periods also. Um, how are we doing with time? Uh, Lula, do you want me to go on? Uh, 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 yes, um, it was 15. Okay. <laughs> um, A little bit more, 15 more minutes or so. Are you, are you tired? Are you tired? Are you good? Can you please? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let, yeah. Oh. Let Let's go to a twelve thirty uh, and give you like a break, little bit, and after that we'll come back for the slideshow. All right. Yeah. Okay. So let me mention a few things uh, of uh, how we prepare and what to look ahead during this time of six weeks until until Christmas. Okay. I'll go through. Um, just mention a few feast days here and what they mean to us, what their messages for us. So we're starting today with St. Philip. Okay, so many, um, as Satan said, I think um, we uh, some people refer to this period of Advent as uh, St. Philip's fast because uh, uh, we celebrate him today. Uh, his message here is um, that he, when he was called by St. Andrew to see to Christ. Uh, he did not go by himself. He took, uh, he told Nathaniel also, and he said, come and see. Um, so we are invited to come and see, to see Jesus, not only as the child of Mary, the rabbi, or the teacher, or prophet, but as the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of God. Uh, the other thing is, um, when Jesus came to Nathaniel, uh, Jesus said to him, oh, I, I knew you even before. Um, Jesus was, uh, 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 Nathaniel was uh, reading the scripture under the tree when Nathaniel called him. So here's the message for us that we know God and he knows us in the scriptures. That's where we find God. So make sure that we read the scriptures. The first feast um, that we celebrate at Advent is on the 21st of um, November. So that's the feast of the entrance of the Mother of God, the Virgin Mary, Theotokos, however you want to call her, into the temple. It's only appropriate that we celebrate her at the beginning of Advent and before um, and Christmas, because she is the one uh, that was chosen to receive Christ, and she is the one uh, example of perfect obedience to the will of God. And this feast, uh, although it's one of the 12 feasts, the 12 great feasts, um, 
it is uh, one that is came into the into the calendar and the church calendar a little bit later uh, in the sixth century or so and it's a feast that is um, much loved by the monastics because here is the Virgin Mary that is dedicated to God she's taken to the temple by her parents and she lives in the temple all this time so totally dedicated to God which monastics are but of course it's a calling by God being chosen by God it's not in our own doing she's such a mystery um she becomes for us the perfect example of what it means to be united with God she is the perfect example of contemplation. She is the perfect example of prayer. She is the perfect example of a mother. Um, I don't know what else it's uh, like. How can we stop talking about her, really? So um, we, uh, we learn from her so much. And she says that she had really a pure mind. She had nothing in no no bad thought ever entered her mind you know um she knew the scriptures and uh, she grew up in the temple and the temple was quite an elaborate um institution at that time the girls that were there they studied the scriptures so they studied the prophets so the girls the jewish girls in the temple they all knew that there was such a thing that uh, one virgin would be chosen <laughs> to um, bear Christ in her womb. And it says, uh, this is from the tradition of the church, not in the scripture, of course. It says that um, many of the girls wished that they would be the chosen. You now they try their best to be a good example and wanting to be the one that is chosen. Does it sound familiar? We all want to be chosen for whatever special something special in life uh, for the project for when, whenever um but it says that mary never that thought never crossed her mind she always wondered who would be the one and it says that she what she prayed was that she would be um able to be a servant to the one that would be chosen to bear Christ. That's who she was. Uh, to me, it's just, um, it's just amazing uh, to talk about the Virgin Mary. It's just, just incredible. Never can say enough. It's just such a mystery. Thank you, Mother. Thank you. You can stop over here. Uh, so, yes. anyone, um, when we have St. Andrew again invites us to see. So, in order to see Christ, you know, it's a matter of will. We want it want to see him and then mm -hmm. we have the example of saint nicholas of uh, being a good teacher a good father and merciful and uh, uh, helper to the orphans so this is uh, on and on so we have so many beautiful uh, examples during the advent to prepare us um, for the feast of um, of the nativity all right Perfect. Um, now, what a beautiful talk. Thank you, Mother Gabriella. It's amazing talk. It's very fruit fruitful. It, uh, we need it in this morning. Thank you. And uh, we need, I do just uh, do a little announcement that after that, Mother Gabriella, she will open the floor for a question. And uh, she's going to um, show us the, um, the monastery. Like a slideshow, the monastery, we're going to visit the, the monastery uh, virtual. That will be like, hope one day we'll go and visit the monastery. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, Mother Gabriella, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. So our monastery was started uh, 33 years ago uh, here in Michigan. You see, I have a large property of 200 acres of land. But most of the buildings, the complex are close to the road. Uh, so we're signed by the road and they were uh, walking in and you see you drive in you'll see the church right in the middle 
Okay, this is to your right where the, and the lower level is the gift shop and the upstairs is a museum, believe it or not. I have a number of, <laughs> quite a number of uh, items uh, in the museum and that is uh, one of the bell towers. We have two bell towers, you will see the other one also. It's a mosaic done by one of our nuns. So here you see the church right smack in the middle. You can't miss it. The church is built in a more of a Romanian monastery style, which is a combination of Byzantine and Gothic style. See, there's the dome inside and then the tower, which is uh, pointed instead of rounded, like the you know, more common of the Byzantine uh, dome. Okay, and then uh, of course, there's, uh, we're blessed to be able to build it in the traditional uh, architecture with the outer porch and then of course the narthex and the main nave and, uh, and the sanctuary which does, uh, forms a good, um, a good uh, opportunity to explain to someone uh, the meaning of uh, the temple. So we're walking and we're in the church now. This is the back uh, door of the church. We have a balcony and that was uh, is the iconosis. The church is all painted, as you can see, and uh, the iconography is done by our nuns. We're a very blessed small community and that uh, has great uh, talent. Wow. Right. We're looking through the church a little bit right now. This is our oldest nun. So our community is made up of uh, eight nuns, ranging from 30 to 90. Of course, one of the main icons here is so the Dormition. That's uh, the main uh, the patronal feast of, of our monastery. You see the balcony up and then uh, down under the balcony. On one side, we have um, the Passion of Christ. And the other side, we have the Miracles. The Pantocrator, of course, in on the center of the church, is, uh, it's, it's Christ looking down. That's very important. Okay, now we are looking at the other bell tower that is right in front of St. Andrew's Chapel. So we have another um, patronal saint. And then the conference room. The conference room has been empty this uh, past nine months. This is in the back of the conference room. This is... Uh, Again, in the front, the courtyard, that's the entrance to the chapel. There's inside St. Andrew's Chapel, which a little bit more work has been done since uh, this picture is taken. Now the drawings of, uh, for the icon of the furnace, a little oh. bit of fall. Oh my God, what a beautiful... Um, very peaceful. There, um, the bookstore. And this is the bookstore, the monastery gift shop. So we have published a few books on the nuns mount the icons. They make prayer robes and um, paint on uh, rocks and other things. A um, few yeah. things that are made by us and of course a few things that we uh, get from other places. And you have online uh, um, store. And yes. Uh, Our books, yes, not all the items in the bookstore are online, but we do have online gift shop. If you go to our website, um, <clears throat> go to the gift shop. Mm -hmm. And we will send the link when we send the, the your talk through the email. I'm gonna send the link of your bookstore too. It will be easy to find it. This is a very popular item. Remember painted nuns. And, oh. Oh, beautiful. Oh. And that's another activity, an icon class, an icon workshop that Mother Olympia does. And this is a picture of a group of course, uh, some years back. Mm -hmm. uh, in good times, we had two workshops per year, one in June and one in October. God willing, maybe next summer we can have one. God willing. What a beautiful and big monastery. Okay, this is the website. 
Okay, ladies, now the floor is open for a question uh, for Mother Gabriella. As you can write your question in the chat or you can raise your hand. And um, now who's gonna ask Mother Gabriella? Thank you, Mother Gabriella, for your time. Thank you. It's a very fruitful uh -huh. and very uplifting um, talk. We need it. Well, tomorrow is gonna be the first, um, the first day of the feast. Uh, of Advent, uh, tomorrow is gonna gonna start it. And hi, Suzanne. Okay, uh, if there is any question? Um, any question for Mother Gabriella? It's honor to have you. How many nuns are currently there? Is in the monastery eight? She said eight eight nuns in the monastery. There is eight nuns in the monastery right now, from age 20, 32 until uh, ninety. And uh, any question for Mother Gabriella? I don't necessarily have a question, but I just wanted to say hi, Mother <laughs> Vicky. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. I miss all of you. I know you're doing, you know, you have to. I, I agree with closing the monastery to visitors, and we just miss you so much. So thank you for this talk. I really appreciate I guess one question would be like, you know, um, about reading the scripture in the home kind of you know like my son he's he's almost seven but um and I, I do try to sometimes like to read like one little verse at a time um do you have a method that you like to recommend for like as a family reading from either the old testament or the new testament it's just something i was thinking about while you were speaking hey, vicky which church are you from and which diocese oh i live in michigan uh southeast michigan um Midwest. Perfect. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mother Gabriella. Okay. Yeah. Vicky is a regular um, visitor to our monastery. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Vicky. Thank I, you. Uh, one of the most difficult things is with having the monasteries closed to tell people they can't come. <laughs> it breaks my heart because um, we're blessed to live here. It's just so beautiful. And I know it, it, uh, it means so much. Uh, for the other. Uh, reading the scripture, I, I remember when I was a child and my mother used to read the scripture and read the Psalms. And I uh, I couldn't figure out like, why is she reading that book? Because I couldn't understand much. <laughs> but of course, um, the grace of God works um, on our hearts. Slowly, slowly, we start to understand. As I mentioned, I think it's good to read the selected uh, Old Testament readings is that you can find in that collection called Prophetologion. Yeah, I think I have it. I'm pretty sure uh, I have it. Just because it's selected, uh, okay? And, uh, uh, and then from the, from the New Testament, uh, I think we can read it from, yes, all the way from Acts to, to uh, except the uh, Apocalypse. That okay. would be a little bit too hard to now. My father Roman never really encouraged us to read the apocalypse, especially by ourselves, only by ourselves. But nevertheless, I don't think we should, yeah, just with, with the Holy Scripture, uh, we allow God to enlighten us as we work. And it's always new, right? We should expect that, that we can't always understand and understand everything when we read the Scripture. We have that experience. We uh, hear the gospel every time we go to church, and it seems like... I know the text by heart, but it means <clears throat> every time. Uh, so just, uh, just keep reading. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and there are commentaries on the scripture also. If we want to really go into studying a little bit more. Uh, yes, there are commentaries on the scripture that can be found. Nowadays with the internet, we find so much on the internet. We don't have to buy that many books. That's true. Thank <laughs> you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. I see there is a question in the chat, and Bibi, she raised her hand too. Uh, Bibi, like, okay, go ahead, unmute yourself and go ask, ask the question. And please tell me your church. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, your church yes. and the diocese. Yes, we can I, hear I you. Just, hello. <laughs> hello, Bibi. I just want to give a plug to Father Alexis Corey, who mm -hmm. reads uh, the scriptures. Yes. Um, and you can find it on uh, Ancient Faith Radio or uh, uh, through his uh, website on St. Philip's Orthodox Church in Davie, Florida. 
because he moved from Louisville, Kentucky, which where he was our priest for over 10 years and we missed him. But uh, it's wonderful to hear his voice and he reads from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. And then he gives a, a little speech at the end. So it's really wonderful. It's about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, depending, but he will read portions from uh, the uh, prophets, uh, uh, Psalms, um, 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 whatever and and then and then whatever comes in so that when you start in january one by the end of december 31 you have finished the whole bible and this yeah. is my second year reading with him and you can listen to him and read along with the bible and it's really wonderful it motivates you to turn on your ipad or whatever and listen to him which church are you from, uh, Phoebe? I, uh, I go to St. Michael's Orthodox Church in Louisville, Kentucky. But uh, I am down in Florida right now for a few mm -hmm. months. Um, and so I'm going to Father Alexis Church, which is in uh, St. Philip's in Davy, Florida. But I'm also a Serbian. So I get the pleasure of going to my Serbian church in North Miami. So it's wonderful to have variety. The Serbian church goes by the old calendar, so our, our holidays don't always conflict, and I get to celebrate twice. Both of them. <laughs> Pleasure to have you. Uh, other yes. question? There is any question in the chat, ladies? Rachel? Nancy? Um, I have one other question. Caroline, which church are you from? Go ahead. Uh, St. Nicholas in Grand Rapids. And hi, Mother Gabriella. Carolyn. Um, I uh, was uh, interested, you had gone over like the first uh, four ways to prepare uh, for Advent and uh, then I don't know whether there was a lot of other ways, you said there are other examples of preparation, um, but how would we find out what those other specific preparations are? I think I was referring uh, of the certain uh, uh, saints that we celebrate, feasts that we celebrate during Advent. Right. Uh, that was St. Andrew, that as, as, a, as an apostle says, come and see. This is how we learn. It's a matter of desiring to see Christ. So we look for him. We desire him. Um, the feast of uh, St. Nicholas that teaches us what a good um, teacher is, uh, that he teaches us um, uh, compassion and uh, love, love for the poor, and charity. Uh, then uh, there's the tree youth that we celebrate. The tree youth uh, in the furnace of Babylon. A great example for uh, for our young people and the children to uh, be strengthened by their strong faith. They were not, uh, you know, uh, at all uh, convinced by the you know, by the king and being in the service of the king, they stood for their faith. And then the, their example is how strong and how beautiful they were by fasting. You know, that's one of the verses in there that is the key verse, the key teaching is that they buy, they were, they, they, you know, they were fed only on seeds and grains and they were stronger and more beautiful and more wise than the ones that lived in the palace and you know, ate the good foods at the feast of the, the, the table of the king. Um, so those are, um, those are some of the other examples. And as we travel closer to, to the feast, and then we have um, the example of the prophets, those who prophesied and the ancestors of Christ. And there is one lesson that you see along the Christ, the Christ genealogy, and not only people from, um, the chosen people of Israel, and not only the righteous, but you have sinners there and prostitutes. And so to say that, that the teaching there is that Christ has come for all of us, not just for a select group of people. So those are the main teachings there. Of, um, Thank you, know. you. That's a really wonderful list. And I will be looking for those. Yes. Uh, no, yeah. the year. And is the Prophet Elogian, is that a book available through your bookstore? Yes. Yes. And I think it's on the website. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So, yeah. Great Thank you so much, Bias. You're welcome. See Mother, you. there is a question for you. They're asking you, who do the mowing? 
Who does the mowing? Who does the mowing? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. I like that person who asked the question because then it's a lot of mowing. Well, we do some mowing, but the miracle is this that there are two fairly young women, they're professionals. They have very good positions in the consumers company here that is based here in Michigan. And, and they do and come and they volunteer, they do the mowing. And they nice. do a wonderful job, like professionals, not just writing the mower. They do a beautiful job. And they have done this, um, you know, with one other person who passed away that's just passed spring. Uh, they have doing this for many years. So uh, what we live here at the mon the experience we live here at the monastery is that really seek first the kingdom and God provides. We're always amazed every single day how God provides. We don't know who is going to come and what God always does. It's really we have to live and encourage you ladies, don't worry. The times are hard. Don't worry. Just remain faithful. God will take care of us. And it's a great experience to see that, you know, for myself, I would say just because I have the responsibility, so to say, as uh, of wisdom, when we had the clothes, they said, how are we going to manage, you know, because maybe I, maybe I, we had the feeling that, oh, we do this work and we offer hospitality and we do this and we do that. So we provide for ourselves and part of that was cut off. And I realized that it's not what we do. It's not how much we accomplish. It's really God's work. And he is yes, God's work. Times and again, that he takes care of us. He there is promise. There is another uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, how we can convert our house to monast little monasteries? Oh, sure. Make sure you have an icon corner and the candeli, a well lamp that all burns there always. Okay. Uh, have your have your Bible, have your prayer book and the songs. And uh, uh, I think it's a great opportunity that we that families together try to get to know one another, communicate, share, pray together, pray together. Make sure, and actually St. Basil the Great does say, you are the ones, you know, everyone, every family, uh, you're the ones who uh, decide who is going to come into your house, uh, okay? So don't allow what or who, don't allow things that are not uh, healthy, that are not good, don't allow them, don't allow disturbances in your house. You're the ones in charge of that. Who and what enters your sanctuary, which is your house, okay? So keep that peace, that joy, that atmosphere in your house, especially you as women are the ones that really have such more, much more um, it's an influence on that and say uh, in that. Just be loving, be forgiving, be loving. Pray together. Doesn't have to be long hours standing in prayer. Don't make fasting and prayer as a chore, as a burden. Make it as a feast, as a privilege, as an opportunity, especially with the younger and the and they said, you know, it's a discipline. So what you have to do, you have to keep that discipline. You keep the discipline. Try to keep the discipline, a schedule. Okay, what you do in the morning throughout the day, and especially if the children are home now. Yeah, so you know, just keep, try to keep on uh, do your best and keeping that word or that that discipline in the house and keep the atmosphere. It says God is joy. Okay, God is joy and he is merciful and he is loving and he is compassionate and he is forgiving. This is what we need to practice. And that's the church. Yes. Yes, he is. That's his church. God is great. And uh, there is two questions. One question, um, one lady asked, are you considered to raise a sheep in your monastery? <laughs> <laughs> we keep talking about not so much a sheep, but maybe a couple of goats and maybe a cow. <laughs> uh, good cow. <laughs> so again, again, yes, we're open to when that's God's will and you need to do that or we'll see a need for it. We only have chickens so far. Uh, chickens so far. Yes, we have chickens. But yes, 
And we need to have the time and the people, uh, you know, to be able to have animals. Actually, some of the some monastics uh, fathers, uh, uh, they advise not to have large or great number of livestock or so because, because um, my mother would say animals have no feast. Uh, so it, it, if it takes you away any any project, any work in the monastery, if it takes you away from the from the life of prayer and the church, the liturgical life, then it's not good. So we have to really grow as we grow with what we can do not to take away from what is more important. And I see there's Mother Elizabeth. Is that from your monastery joining us on the Zoom? Uh, no, no, she's in Florida. She's ah, actually, from Florida. But yeah. she knows us. I know her. I knew, I knew her since she was young. And she knew Mother Alexandra also quite well. Oh, so she's from, from Pennsylvania, from Eastern Pennsylvania. She's from... Yes, that part of the country. Rula, it says she's from New Tifkan Skeet of the Holy Mother of God. Yeah. Welcome, Mother Elizabeth. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, more questions, ladies? Yes. Uh, Carly, Carly Frederica, Frederick. Hi, Mother. Hi, Carly. Which church are you from? Uh, which church are you from? Holy Transfiguration Orthodox Church in Columbus, Georgia. Welcome. And um, Mother, thank you for your talk, as always. I also wanted to bring up, I am very appreciative that you are live streaming the liturgy and the Vespers and the, uh, the daily prayer every day. I am so grateful that you do that. I love hearing your voices each day. <laughs> it's a uh, little offering. So, um, yes, yeah, so for you ladies, uh, yes, uh, several monasteries uh, probably stream services every day. We stream every day also. So during Advent and God forbid if the church will be closed again or a very limited number of people who can go to church, um, you, can, uh, you can tune in in uh, a monastery of your choice uh, to uh, listen to the services. At least just a little bit, you know, maybe Vespers just because you hear the hymns of the day, the saint of the day, just a little bit, not, maybe not the whole service, whatever, but the opportunities is there. So we're, um, we're, we're glad to share that, absolutely. Um, I'm afraid to tell you ladies, we have just only with Mother Gabriella uh, five minutes uh, because we have other thing, other business with Antiochian women. Um, we have a meeting, our meeting will be start at 1.10 exactly. And uh, we can give you break, bathroom break, one minute, two minutes for the bathroom. We would like to go and get something to drink. And uh, welcome anyone to stay with us to um, to hear our uh, meeting. Will be announcement and uh, um, welcome if you want to would like to stay. And uh, now you have a couple of minutes to ask Mother uh, Gabriella um, a question. Any question? Please raise your hand or uh, put in the chat. No question. If. Always a blessing. Yes, always a blessing to have Mother Gabriella with us. Yes. Yes. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, all the Antiochian women of the East, uh, Diocese of Charleston, Auckland, and Mid-Atlantic, New York, and Washington, D.C., please stay with us. It's going to be a short meeting. Just um, Bishop Thomas to everyone. I think people may need more than one <laughs> minutes for a break. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, you have you, you, you can take a break break now from now until ten. Um, one ten. Oh, uh, it's been six minutes. Say it now. Okay, we'll listen. Six minutes. Um, for bathroom break, and uh, we're gonna be quick. I don't wanna lose the audience. Uh, please stay with us. And uh, it's honor to have Mother Gabriella. It was blinding to see her uh, last March as our speaker at the Antiochian village, but uh, COVID, we can, because of COVID, we cancel it and we reschedule it for next March, but we are decided um, yesterday to cancel it too. Um, the DMC, they cancel their uh, spring retreat in the Antiochian village and uh, with the same thing, we're going to cancel our retreat. 
um, uh, face to face, but we will have it through, um, we'll have it through um, virtual like this. Uh, we're gonna be like the, in March and it's gonna be a long uh, weekend. We're gonna do uh, more than, uh, March will be the Antiochian Women uh, Month. And we're going to do a lot of activities for the women that month. And um, be uh, be tuned and uh, be stay like be uh, watching your emails. And um, uh, now the bathroom break just started two minutes ago. And you still you can go to the bathroom or drink something or uh, come back at 1:10 exactly. Is meeting our meeting is gonna be a quick just announcement. Thank you for your invitation to attend. Lovely. Yes, please stay. Anyone would like to stay, you can stay with us. It's open for everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Mother Gabriella. It's a beautiful and amazing and uplifting presentation. And you did good. See, first time in Zoom, you did a great job. Thank you. I love it. Very beautiful. You ladies are so gracious. <laughs> yes, you know, you're so gracious. It's, uh, it's a joy to be with you. Absolutely. Yes. And the Antiochian women, I can't say enough about it. It's my joy. Many of the Antiochian parishes are, uh, are good friends of our monastery. So it's always a, a joy. And now you are in our prayers. Yes, yeah. all just all names. We are all one. We just yes. need Antiochian, yeah. Serbian, uh, uh, any church. We are all one. We're all or we're all, all. all people. Yes. yes. You have the right. You have the right attitude, you ladies. Yes. God bless you. And just uh, know that you are in our prayers. And however we can help any uh, any time, just uh, let us know. Uh, yes. And yes. don't forget, don't put Christ away with the Christmas decorations. Keep him in the living room. <laughs> Yes, we will do that. Yes, yes, it's a great yeah. honor to have you. Like it's, we're we're so happy, yes. uplifting, and we heard a lot of good things about you. And uh, really, it's a beautiful talk. And I'm sure we're gonna invite you next year. I hope face to face, but look like it's not gonna be face to face. It's gonna be um, maybe the 2020. Maybe 2020 you will be our speaker face to face. And we would God like willing, to see God willing, God willing, of course, God willing. Whatever God has for us, that will be wonderful. Yes, so, yeah. Um, yes. Well, that will be a good, uh, probably um, a nice advent because uh, I hope there are no, not too many Christmas parties that you ladies have to go to. <laughs> yes, people, they have to be quarantined now, no yes, Christmas party. Uh, it's been so there. That will be, yeah, that will be to our advantage, yes. Yes, do the, like the time they spend it during shopping or uh -huh. uh, yes, just uh, spend it um, spend with the family and uh, read the scriptures, the Bible, and uh, yes, yes it will be a true a true preparation, a true celebration of uh, of Christ's nativity. I think all with the family and in a prayerful atmosphere. Uh, yes, and singing Christmas carols. Yes, that will yes. be um, yes. Have to sing together as a as a family. Teach the children Christmas carols. Perfect. Then, and uh, I have an idea. That be the money you are used to put for uh, gifts for your relatives and your cousins mm -hmm. and kids. And now the money now you can put it in the church uh, for the people they need. A lot of people yes. they need overseas yes. in Syria and Lebanon and Palestine. Yes. And, Everywhere. Uh, Yes, yes, you can put the money instead of like um, not giving like for your presents and uh, gifts. Yes. People, other people, so, they need our help. And uh, thank you all for staying with us. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate um, your time. Your time is precious for us. And thank you, Mother Gabriella. 